Good morning, everyone. And thanks for, uh, for coming this morning. Uh, September is prepared this month uh, here in Vermont. So we want to make sure we take the time to encourage Vermonters to take action in order to protect themselves, their family, their home, and their friends and neighbors during a disaster. Vermont has dedicated, uh, has many dedicated and well-trained emergency response uh, community members. But during a widespread event, it helps them when communities, businesses, and families are prepared. The first thing you should do is make a plan for you and your family. Figure out where you and your family will reunite if separated, and how your family will communicate during a disaster. And make sure everyone knows the plan, because you can help reduce anxiety if kids know where there is a plan to keep them safe. Stock essential supplies like canned food and water, as well as medications, in case you are ever uh, homebounded and lack essential services like water or electricity. Folks with functional needs who would need to, uh, assistance during an emergency should sign up for Citizens Assistance Registry for Emergencies, also known as CARE. This registry allows emergency response agencies to identify and aid those who might need special help during an event. This includes Vermonters who use special medical equipment or need help with transportation during a disaster. You can let uh, local responders know of your situation right now by registering for the CARE program at e911.vermont.gov care. I'm pleased to have Barb Neal with us from E911 to answer any questions you might have on this CARE program. We also know the more informed you are about an emergency, the more prepared you are. So we encourage all Vermonters to register for Vermont Alert at vermontalert.gov. Vermont Alert provides real-time information on pending emergencies, weather, and information on things like road closures, boil water notices, and other important public notices. There are also many state resources on social media. On Facebook and Twitter, you can follow Vermont Emergency Management, Vermont Department of Health, National Weather, Weather Service, and the Vermont Agency of Transportation. As we all know, while we can plan for disasters, they can happen at any time, including during, during the school day. We've made a lot of progress making sure we have emergency plans in place to protect kids, both at school and during events outside the school. Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary of the Vermont Agency of Education, will, show, show, uh, will share more on that uh, at this time. Thanks, Heather. Thank you, Governor. I'd first like to thank Governor Scott and my colleagues at the Department of Public Safety for highlighting September as Preparedness Month. As we all know, there are few things more important than ensuring Vermonters can safely live, work, play, and learn across our wonderful state. I'd like to speak today about the importance of strong emergency plans in our schools and education facilities. Specifically, we all need to make sure we're creating, updating, and exercising strong emergency plans in these settings. School districts and education systems face many complex security risks today. From severe weather to interpersonal threats, there are many challenges schools must be able to tackle to keep our youngest Vermonters safe. It is critical that our schools and our pre-K facilities have strong, well-developed, and regular, regularly updated emergency plans. It is also critical that all staff are familiar with plans, understand the various scenarios or possible events that could occur, and are ready to take action to protect their students and their colleagues. At the State of Vermont, and specifically at the Agency of Education, we recognize the importance and complexity of these local responsibilities. We're collaborating with our colleagues at the Department of Public Safety to work with school districts, helping them design and update these emergency plans. This summer, we engaged in an outreach process to school districts and independent schools to assess their needs and challenges. Our agencies, in collaboration with contracted vendor Margolis Healy of South Burlington, analyzed and identified several areas where we can help schools. Our next step is to offer a series of two-day planning workshops around the state. 
where designated school emergency contact personnel in high need districts can learn best practices, can get help developing or updating their school's plans, and can get to know and share information and resources with colleagues from other districts. These workshops will start in October and will help schools align their emergency plans to both national best practices and federal school, fa school safety recommendations. In the final phase of the project, we will be offering 60 shorter training sessions paired with voluntary emergency response exercises open to all schools. Again, to all entities across our cradle to career education system, making sure you have solid, up-to-date emergency plans is critical to ensuring our state facilities can best respond to emergencies. We're urging all school districts and education systems to develop a plan now if they have not yet done so, review existing plans and make sure they are up-to-date and based on best practice, and ensure that all staff members are familiar with your plan and what to do in various situations. We're also committed to providing resources and assistance to schools that need it to help make sure all Vermont learners are safe in any emergency. Another great concern for Vermonters is the impact of disasters on their property. The best defense against costly losses is flood insurance. And now Vermont Emergency Management Director Erica Bornman will speak to that. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Governor. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner. Thank you uh, to Commissioner uh, Sherling. As, as we highlight preparedness month at the Division of Emergency Management, it's truly uh, our um, holiday month of the year as we, uh, as our day-to-day -day responsibility is to ensure that all Vermonters are prepared for what disasters might bring us. So I want to highlight uh, a really important um, topic today. Uh, when we experienced a catastrophic disaster like we did in 2011 with Tropical Storm Irene, there are programs through FEMA that can aid homeowners in recovering from damage to their homes, but those programs are capped at sixteen or at thirty-three thousand dollars per home, and really the average program uh, grant is about eight thousand dollars per homeowner. Now that is not going to make you whole. The only thing that can do that is flood insurance. Bear in mind, one inch of water in your home can cause as much as $25,000 in damage. So again, flood insurance is really your best method for ensuring that you don't have to rely upon your own resources uh, to, uh, to recover from a, a, a disaster. Yet, only 16%, one six percent of Vermonters in special high-risk flood areas in Vermont are covered by flood insurance. That means over 10,000 structures in Vermont are not insured against our number one hazard, which is flooding. Flooding also occurs outside of these special flood hazard areas. About 20% of all flood insurance claims are, uh, are damaged uh, from flooding actually occurs outside of these uh, flood insurance or uh, special flood hazard areas. Yet only one half a percent, one half of one percent of all Vermonters are covered with flood insurance outside a special flood hazard area. So, what can homeowners do? First, check with your town to see if your home is located in a special, special flood hazard area. Your towns have that information. Then, you should check with their insurance agent. Often, depending on the elevation of your home, um, the value of your home, and it, there are uh, relatively inexpensive or, and or affordable uh, ways to insure yourself against floods. Um, it's very dependent on where you are and where your structure is located, but like I said, as we all know in Vermont, if it can rain at your house, it can flood at your house. And flood insurance is the best way to, uh, to prepare yourself and your family for Vermont's number one hazard. You can get more information at floodsmart.gov or you can go to floodready.vermont.gov. And of course, anytime that you have any questions, feel free to contact any one of us at Vermont Emergency Management and we'd be happy to point you in the right direction. With that, that concludes our remarks, and I would like to hand it over, uh, back over to Governor Scott. Well, thank you, Erica. And um, we'll open it up for questions on the topic at this time. 
you think this has become more important with climate change that we're just getting more and more storms that are more violent and, and this is going to be a continuing if not growing problem in the future? I, I do believe that's going to be the case. I mean these, uh, these weather patterns we're seeing uh, throughout the winter uh, as well. We see extreme temperature changes, shifts, uh, and then we see, we see snow, then we see rain. Uh, which can lead to, uh, to ice uh, jams and so forth, which can lead to flooding. So uh, I think uh, a lot of what we're seeing today in terms of weather is due to climate change. So we need to better prepare, become more resilient uh, in a lot of respects. And we've taken a lot of steps in, in that direction here in Vermont. Uh, we're ranked as one of the, the leading states in, in resiliency, I believe. Um, so uh, we have a lot to be proud of, but there's more we can do, and there's a lot of uh, things we can do uh, individually as well, and that's what we're here to highlight and just make sure that people uh, don't take things for granted. Uh, since Irene, we obviously haven't seen anything as dramatic. Is that is like a singular instance? But is there is the state been tracking uh, claims that have been made um, for damage, uh, or, or has some way of tracking? I guess the the, the flooding damage that we've seen since then. How it's over time or yeah, yeah. I'd be happy sure to, to that um, so since Irene or actually since 2011 the state of Vermont has experienced 11 uh, declared major disasters and uh, that is over 250 million dollars in public infrastructure damage which includes the damage from Irene um, Irene we uh, we had about 23 to 24 million dollars that was issued that was issued to uh, homeowners um, and since Irene through the hazard mitigation grant program um, and various other mitigation grants we've um, actually spent about 53 million dollars in mitigating future disasters which is a huge success for for Vermont Uh, to your point, Bob, I'm not sure that uh, we we probably have kept track, and there probably is a way to get the data from the previous decades to see, you know, if it's escalating in, in uh, many respects. The number of events it'd be interesting to see. Other questions on emergency preparedness? happy to answer any other questions you might have. Governor Scott, initially you were supposed to head to the arrival of the F-35s. Why did that change? Well, I don't know if it's changed. And, uh, it, you know, we weren't sure exactly when it was going to be. We, we put my schedule together uh, long in advance of, uh, of that. Uh, and when we can't get a specific date, um, then, then I'm not able to attend. I have to make, uh, make choices. Uh, but there are more aircraft to arrive. Uh, this is only uh, two of, uh, of the number of, uh, of uh, F-35s that are coming. Uh, we'll have uh, other events uh, when uh, all the aircraft uh, arrive in Vermont. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, uh, I've been a staunch supporter of the F-35 and continue to be. It's a big day for the Air National Guard. Um, in light of the allegations that came forward uh, last year with the misconduct and all that, I mean, sort of how, how far sort of have we come in the dialogue um, and public discussion about, you know, the, uh, the Air National Guard and relating to the F-35 too? Well, I think uh, in terms of uh, transparency, we've, we've come a long ways. Uh, we have a long ways to go, but I think the policies that have been put into place, um, the way we've tried to handle this and learning from mistakes of the past are, are something that uh, we can always improve on. Uh, but uh, but I you know I'm a, again I uh, I value uh, the Vermont National Guard uh, the Green Mountain Boys uh, and and the uh, all that uh, they offer and bring to Vermont has been something that's been essential uh, to our economy uh, as well as the defense of our country. You said you were a big supporter of the F-35. Is that why? Is it an economic? Uh it's it's all the above from my standpoint. Again, uh, I'm very uh, very proud of uh, of our history uh, in terms of uh, defense and what we can do as a state. Uh, and as we uh, as we've evolved as a, as a national guard, um, we've taken uh, we've taken steps in in trying to protect our national security. Um, so I'm proud from that standpoint, but also uh, from an economic standpoint, uh, it means a lot to Vermont. Uh, the uh, the uh, the 
uh, facility that we have uh, in the, in the Burlington area <coughs> is uh, has become upgraded, uh, employs a lot of people, and again uh, is uh, is vital uh, to what we're doing. Uh, we're trying to attract more people to the state as well, and uh, we want to make sure that we uh, we continue uh, to protect uh, those we have here and the the economic uh, resources we have. Do you share any of the concerns about quality of life issues, uh, the, the noise that this could create? And Obviously, every protest and whatnot. Do you yeah. Well, we've had this. Uh, there's a lot of history uh, with uh, aviation in Vermont. Uh, I remember I um, grew up in nearby Barrie and remember uh, some of the sonic booms from the F 4s. Uh, and that was when I was just a kid, you know, 40, 40 50 years ago. So uh, this is nothing new, um, but, uh, but I share the concerns. I know the Guard is taking this seriously and doing every, uh, everything they can to alleviate uh, any, any disruption in the lives of, uh, of Vermonters. They want to be good neighbors. You were talking earlier about climate change and emergency preparedness. It seems like there's going to be a lot of students out on the street tomorrow, uh, high school students, college students, <clears throat> climate strike. What are your thoughts about uh, this approach to raising more awareness about the issue? Well, I, you know, I, I value uh, this public dialogue. I, I think it's uh, it's good uh, for students to get involved, um, and uh, and I and I think uh, we again, as long as it's civil and respectful, uh, it's the way we learn and it's the way we evolve. So um, we'll see uh, see what happens uh, tomorrow, uh, but uh, but I know um, there are many uh, that are going to participate throughout the country, I believe, uh, and we'll see uh, how many come to uh, to Montpelier. Last session, uh, legislation relating to climate change and, and passing meaningful uh, legislation kind of fizzled out on the floor, didn't really get passed. Um, what, what can your office do, and are you looking at anything going into the upcoming session as well? Well, I think we've, we've taken a lot of steps uh, over the years. Uh, first of all, uh, we have a, a goal in this state of 90% renewables by 2050. I believe that that uh, is doable and we're taking steps in order to achieve that. Uh, we've also, uh, as we migrate towards electric vehicles, I think that's, that's part of the answer. Uh, I, I believe a major, a large uh, percentage of carbon emissions are transportation related. So the sooner we can get to uh, electric vehicles, the better off we're going to be and the better off we're going to be in, in terms of, uh, uh, of attaining our 90% renewable goal by 2050. And I believe, again, I believe we can do that. We've, we put together an infrastructure, a charging infrastructure that we're going to be able to, to, uh, to put in place uh, along our I-89 and I-91 corridors, and that's something that we passed last, uh, last year, and uh, utilizing some of the money from the Volkswagen settlement. So uh, we're taking steps uh, in this area, as well as uh, trying to uh, you know, walk the talk, so to speak, and, and we're doing, taking some steps uh, to put some uh, more uh, electric vehicles in the state fleet as well. Do you think our statutory emissions reduction um, requirements are, are at all realistic? Do you think there's any way that we're going to be able to meet those? Well, again, I, I think what we're going to see, it's not linear. You know, it's not going to be a, a steady transition uh, from a start to finish. I, I believe it's going to go because technology changes and advances, and, and the more we acclimate ourselves to electric vehicles, so to speak, we're going to see a ramp up at that point. So that's what I'm looking forward to. Uh, and it takes, it takes a while uh, to change uh, people's viewpoints. Uh, and, and, and again, we're seeing this, uh, this right before our eyes, uh, how, how quickly uh, I believe that we'll, we'll get to EV uh, electric vehicles um, very quick um, once we, you know, a better battery um, storage, uh, and that's, that's being engineered as we speak. Uh, all-wheel vehicles, uh, you know, and electric vehicles. And, and again, we're just seeing so much uh, advancement and acceptance in that area. So I believe we'll see it, uh, you know, in the next uh, decade, a uh, huge swing. Are there any climate change policies or uh, proposals that you plan on pushing for in January? Um, we'll, we haven't put our packages all together at this point, uh, but, uh, but we'll, we'll see where we can, uh, we can make some, some gains. Where we generally think we should generally be going, whether it's 
more investments in EVs? Yeah, I, I, you know, we have a, a long ways to go in terms of EVs. We have a long ways to go in, in terms of charging infrastructure. We've taken some steps, uh, but but uh, but we need to do do more and and get behind that and focus uh, on on areas. I, I don't want us. Uh, uh, to to take off on another initiative where we haven't completed the one right before us. What are there about five thousand EVs now in the state? And the goal is to hit yeah. fifty thousand. Yeah, I'm not sure that I don't even years? know if there's five thousand. Yeah. Uh, there may be. I mean, is that fewer. a realistic goal? I I do I believe so. Um, big, again, if you look at uh, the number, maybe in the last uh, year or two, and start to see the uptick uh, and. And again, when you see, I've used this example before, when you see uh, companies like Harley Davidson, for instance, uh, come out with a line of electric motorcycles, you know things are changing, right? You see, uh, you see Ford uh, going to come forward with a, uh, an F-150 that's going to be electric. And when you start to see pickups and, and other types of, uh, of uh, vehicles uh, using uh, electric uh, uh, propulsion, then you're going to see uh, an acceptance uh, and, and a ramp up. And so I, uh, Lamborghini uh, came out with one, Bugatti has one too. I mean, they, they, it's just amazing what's happening right now in the electric world. It, it really is exciting in, in a lot of respects. Is there a protocol for state employees uh, when it comes to these protests tomorrow? Are they allowed to participate? They so choose. Uh, I, I haven't uh, I haven't heard of any uh, any uh, anyone asking uh, at this point in time uh, they what they do on their personal time if they uh, if they want to take uh, the time off to do so uh, it would be just like any other event I but I haven't heard of, uh, of a widespread um, case where people want to but but maybe there is have you heard of anybody no I was okay. just wondering <laughs> if there's any policy for state employees I think the governor nailed it. It's basically personal time. Individuals yeah. want to take personal time to testify in their personal capacity at the legislature or take part in a demonstration. That's between them and their supervisors, but it's available option. We don't discourage that right. uh, at all. You know, with all the health concerns about uh, vaping and e-cigarettes, uh, I know the legislature addressed that by raising the age and taxing it, but do you think Vermont should follow the lead of some other cities and perhaps states and just ban these yeah. things? We'll, we'll see uh, where uh, the federal government goes. I mean, uh, the, the president made some statements. We'll see if he follows through on, uh, on those statements. And um, it would be better if we did it uh, nationally uh, rather than individually, but uh, I believe in states' rights, and, uh, and I think that if uh, the feds don't take action, that uh, you see more and more states, and Vermont might be one of them, uh, that might take some steps in trying to curtail this, because it is, as I highlighted in my uh, State of the State and Budget Address, um, we, we see uh, the, the number of, of kids, and it's, it's really um, something that we need to pay attention to, uh, that, are, that are becoming more addicted uh, to vaping. Would you like to see the federal government do it? Yes. Yeah, I, w I would like to see uh, the federal government follow through on something that we know is going to be is, is becoming an epidemic. Vermont State College's trustees announced yesterday that they want to keep the Linden campus open. Is that something that you're going to support? Um, we'll see what they come uh, forward with, uh, the state colleges. Uh, I know uh, that uh, you know, our, our colleges and universities are under enormous stress. Uh, most of that uh, due to enrollment or the downturn in enrollment. Our state colleges uh, suffer from the demographics uh, that we have in the state. Uh, I, I talk about this a lot, um, 30,000 fewer kids in our schools uh, f uh, than 20 years ago. Um, we have, and that, that equates to fewer students going on to uh, higher institutions and our state colleges have has a 90 percent enrollment rate of, uh, of Vermont kids so um, this uh, this is uh, this is affecting us uh, and we need to do uh, something about that which we're, we're trying to do attract more people uh, to the state uh, and uh, and doing uh, taking a lot of measures and trying to do so uh, but uh, but the state colleges are, are I know they're contemplating what what actions they can take uh, to keep uh, keep uh, their uh, their rates lower uh, and uh, also attract more people. 
because that's what's needed. We need the enrollment to, to, to grow to the, to the infrastructure that we have. Speaking of demographics as, as well, there's um, a group of senators that are traveling across the state right now, sort of hearing from people about affordable housing, um, you know, looking into potentially another bond like we saw last session. I guess what, what are your thoughts in terms of, uh, you know, growing affordable housing to uh, accommodate for, you know, these demographics? Well, first of all, I think it's really healthy uh, that uh, the legislature, uh, legislators get out uh, to this throughout the state uh, to see in, in real time what's happening. Uh, we do this with our capital for a day uh, where we take the entire cabinet and go out and visit a different county. Uh, and uh, we've heard uh, a lot about this. In fact, when I did my, uh, when I was Lieutenant Governor, I went out on a Vermont Everyday Jobs Tour. And that's where I learned uh, about the need for housing, uh, safe, uh, uh, efficient and uh, affordable housing, uh, and that's what what's we desperately need for the workforce and others. Uh, so uh, that's why we passed the $37 million uh, housing bond, uh, worked with the legislature to do so. Uh, we know we have other st steps to take, uh, but we haven't seen uh, the, all the effects of the $37 million at this point. Um, there's still, uh, there's still uh, many that haven't broken ground, um, but uh, but we're working towards that. But we need to to look further. We have a a couple of things in mind in terms of renovating existing stock. I talked about this uh, this last year. I'm hopeful that we can do something. Many communities have uh, dilapidated housing stock that need to be renovated, uh, and there may need to be uh, some uh, tax credits or something uh, to incentivize that. So. So we're looking uh, at, uh, at trying to, we have the same goal uh, and we'll do whatever we can. The problem is uh, in just uh, using another uh, um, bond uh, is that, uh, you know, we, we can't, it's not an infinite amount of money that we can borrow. Uh, we have a, uh, our, our rating was downgraded uh, this past year. It's a concern um, and we, uh, we have limits. We have a debt affordability committee that takes a look at that to make sure that we don't borrow more than we, we should and we're at the cap. So we, uh, we have to consider a lot before we move forward with this. But the bottom line is we share the goal of more affordable housing uh, for Vermonters. Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.